This is MathGuy.com. My name is Mark Karadimos. Today we're going to talk about radioactivity and we're going to do some problems related to it. So in this video we have four sections. We're going to talk about uh, the formula and what it actually means to uh, deal with radioactivity. Uh, our part two is going to talk about an example about how to calculate mass. Uh, number three, our third section that is, we're going to talk about uh, another example where we're going to calculate for time. In our fourth section, we're going to talk about plutonium. All right, let's get to work. Well, what is radioactivity? Well, you should know that there are substances in our universe that are decaying over time. In the decay in that they emit high energy particles and those high energy particles can be beneficial or dangerous depending on how they're used but as they emit particles the substance is slowly degrading or decaying over time that's why sometimes we call it radioactive decay all right let's say for instance we have a certain radioactive substance uh, that has a half-life of let's say 50 years. Yep. Okay, let's also say that we start off with 32 grams of this. So we got a small amount of this substance and we want to figure out what happens over time. Well it turns out that if you allow 50 years to pass, half of the substance will disintegrate or be given off as high energy particles. Okay, so half, half of 32 is 16. Well, if we wait another 50 years, it'll drop to 8 grams, and then 4 grams, and then 2 grams. Okay, so every time we go down the chain, 50 years pass. So you can see that was a total of 200 years. So I'm writing sloppy here. Okay, so I've got, it took 200 years to go from 32 grams to 2 grams. And that kind of demonstrates what this term half-life means because it's going to be thrown around a lot with radioactive uh, substances and problems that deal with those substances. Here also is the formula that we're going to use that describes this process. So as we use this formula, you'll see in the top right here, uh, let's talk about what these letters or variables represent. So the P stands for the amount of starting substance, so it's how much we start with. The A stands for how much we'll be left with after a certain amount of time transpires. So T stands for time and H stands for the half-life of the substance. So we're going to be using that formula on the next two problems that we face. All right, let's get to those problems. All right, let's get to our first example about mass. So let's say we're dealing with a radioactive substance called radium-226. The 226 is just an indicator of the isotope. It may have something to do with the number of protons, I believe, or neutrons that the substance has. Uh, I do know that radium-226 has a half-life, and the half-life is 1,600 years. So a very long half-life. It sticks around for a long time. Uh, okay, let's say we're going to figure out how much of 100 grams will be left after 5,000 years. Okay, like for instance the problem may say radium-226 with a half-life of 1,600 years is allowed to decay for 5,000 years. How much of 100 grams will be left? Okay, well let's actually deal with this problem. So we're going to use the formula. So we're going to plug in numbers into the formula. So it turns out that we have 100 grams, that's our P. We're always going to use half because we have a half-life. It loses substance over time. 
Our time is 5,000 years. And we're going to put this all over H. And we know that the half-life is 1,600 years. Now, this T over H, which I have right here, is actually a power. That is an exponent on top of a one-half base. So if you have a TI Inspire calculator, you're going to plug it in, uh, or some equivalent calculator, you're going to plug it in exactly the way it looks like this, it, keeping in mind that this is an exponent on the half. If you don't have a really fancy calculator, I would actually divide this first and get a decimal, and I would take 0.5 and raise it to that decimal. And then when you get an answer from that, you multiply that by 100. That would be probably my attack plan if I didn't have a really great calculator. Okay, I plugged this in earlier, and it turns out that it's 11.46 years. I'm sorry, 11.46 grams. So this is how much substance is going to be left after 5,000 years. So in other words, it's going to be hanging around a long time, and uh, it took a long time for it to decay from... 100 grams down to approximately about one-tenth of its original amount to 11.46 grams. All right, it's an easy problem when you're just calculating what happens, uh, how much mass is left after time. All right, let's get to the harder problem. That will be our next section. All right, here's our next example. This is section three of our video. Uh, let's talk about argon. There is a isotope of argon this is argon 39 and it has a half-life of 269 years okay let's say we start with 20 grams so we have a small amount of argon we want to know how long is it going to take before we have two grams of the same radioactive isotope. All right, so the problem would say, if we have argon-39, which has a half-life of 269 years, how long will it take 20 grams of the substance to decay to 2 grams? All right, let's solve the problem. So in, in order to solve it, we're, uh, we're obviously going to use this equation, and we're going to plug in numbers. So our end amount, that's A, is going to be 2 grams. Our starting amount is 20. We always have this half. And we're going to raise it to the T power, because we don't know what time it is here. But we do know the half-life. The half-life is 269. Well, if you haven't already noticed, we never use this ha uh, isotope number. Again, that has nothing to do with this formula. It's just the name of this particular radioactive isotope may have something to do with the number of protons or neutrons. Okay, moving on, let's figure out what to do. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is get my base alone. This problem has a one-half base. I'd like to get it alone. I'm trying to isolate this term because it has a power, and specifically there's a variable in the power. So I'd like to get rid of this 20, which I'm multiplying by this base. So to get rid of 20 that's being multiplied, well, I'm going to divide. I'm going to divide both sides by 20. Okay, I can reduce this. 2 over 20, that's 1 tenth. Okay, so I get 1 tenth equals 1 half. And this 1 half is being raised to the T over 269 power. Again, this is an exponent on the half. It's hard for me to write it here, but picture that being a little exponent there. Now, when we deal with a problem like this that has a variable exponent, we're going to employ the use of logarithms. And this is where, and this is why people learn logarithms, is to deal with problems that are exactly like this, when you have variable exponents, or variables in the exponent slot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the log of both sides. Take a log. Now this is log base 10. I'm not writing the base, it's just log base 10. Now, why am I taking the log of both sides, you may be asking. That's because logarithms have a special property. And the property says that if I'm taking the log of something that has a power, I could bring the power out in front. So this is one property. I could bring that t over 269 and bring it right in front of the logarithm. And I'm going to do that. So I'm going to write on the 
right side, I'm going to write t over 269 log of the half. This is beautiful because now I no longer have a variable exponent. Now t over 269 is a simple coefficient and now the rules of algebra are going to be used from this point forward. I don't have to worry about this logarithm stuff because it's just going to be something I'm going to plug in a calculator. All right, to solve for t, you'll notice that I'm dividing it by 269. So if I'm dividing t by 269, well, then I'm going to multiply both sides by 269. I'm going to do the opposite. All right, that's good news because now the 269s have canceled on the right side. All right, so I still have t, and I'm multiplying it by the log of the half. So the opposite is to divide both sides by the log of a half. All right, in doing so, again, I'm canceling this out. And you'll notice that the only letter left on the left side of this equation is that letter T. Oop, let me back up. I'm trying to stay consistent with my letters here. Let's stay with the white. Okay, so. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to plug all of this of what you see into the calculator exactly the way it is into the calculator. Uh, I could do that because I'm using a really fancy calculator called a TI Inspire. If not, you got to simplify, you got to play around with your calculator and get used to it. So however it is you manage your calculator, you have to plug in this very compound looking expression. So be careful. Just be careful how you plug it in, but that is going to be the solution. Now, I've already done that, so I already know what the solution is going to be. Turns out, my calculator tells me it's 624.6. Of course, this is t, so of course it's years. So now I know that it takes 624.6 years to go from 20 grams of argon-39 to 2 grams of argon-39. Okay, you can see it's a very difficult problem because it involves logarithms. Got to be very difficult or careful it is while you're doing a problem like this. As a side note, uh, we should know that uh, the radioactive waste that comes out of nuclear power plants does contain several different types of isotopes some isotopes that have a very uh, small half-life and decay very quickly, some have a very long half-life and decay very slowly, all of which are very deadly, okay, all of this nuclear waste. But in particular, there is one type of radioactive waste called plutonium. It's called plutonium-239. Now, I, I just want to bring this up real quickly and briefly because Plutonium-239, which is in radioactive waste, has a half-life of 24,000, yep, 24,000 years. You know, uh, every time I hear people say that radioactivity is clean, uh, it's not true. Uh, yeah, we may not see the carbon emissions that come out, uh, you know, and deal with it like a coal plant, but on the other side, we're, you know, training, taking all this you know, nuclear waste and putting it on trains, and we're putting it and burying it in uh, areas. And the radioactive waste uh, is going to last for eons, because the radioactive waste has a half-life, at least some of the radioactive waste has a half-life of 24,000 years. So we're talking, like I said, eons, and many, many thousands and thousands of generations of humans are going to have to contend with this that we're burying inside mountains in the ground. Okay, so let's not have anyone fool you or us or anyone and say that nuclear energy is exactly clean because it's not. Nothing is clean. No energy pr production that we do is going to be clean, and uh, radioactivity does have its disadvantages. Uh, this is not to say that I'm anti-nuclear use. It's just to say that we should walk into nuclear uh, energy with our eyes wide open and know what we're getting into. All right. 
This is MathGuy.com. Make sure you go back to uh, our website, check out our other instructional videos, interactive quizzes, and text-based lessons. Take care.